ASEF is proud to introduce 88 Days from Ground to Green, the story of Greensburg, Kansas school recovery and rebuild after a devastating EF5 tornado. This exciting program was created on site in consultation with Greensburg administrators, teachers, and students. This program is the first of many productions to inform educational professionals about how to begin community discussions surrounding sustainability and creating LEED certified schools. Furthermore, ASEF is here to inform, train, and assist educational professionals in public early childhood schools, K-12 schools, and institutions of higher education on issues related to educational facilities. This is from the National Weather Service in Dodge City. They have issued a tornado emergency. This is very rare. We've got a monster, monster wedge tornado. I'm, I'm, I'm about four, four to five miles south of Pittsburgh. Uh, Jay, this tornado is a very big tornado. In the evening of May 4th, 2007, an EF5 tornado approached the small city of Greensburg, Kansas from due south. Oh my gosh. That is a huge wedge. Look at that. It struck the town about 9.45 with winds in excess of 200 miles per hour and a damaged path 1.7 miles wide. Dawn revealed almost total devastation. 10 lives had been lost and 95% of Greensburg was destroyed including, with the exception of two vehicles which had been out of town, every asset of the Greensburg School District. As far as the school, we lost every building, book, ball, and bus we had. The biggest challenge was, of course, losing our school, because that was our, to me, it was our community. But they would rebuild. This is the story of Greensburg's new groundbreaking LEED Platinum School and the critical decisions, struggles, and perseverance that led to its creation. Eighty-eight days, from ground to green, the Greensburg School rebuild. In the immediate aftermath of any major natural disaster, there is a normal and necessary time of mourning for the people affected. A lot of things changed right after the tornado with regard to our population and school counts and things like that. They're just very typical, small, rural, South Central Kansas town that people uh, strong in family, uh, really active in their church and really active in their school, and kind of live life day to day. It was a terrible experience. We still grieve the friends we lost in that tornado, but there was a recognition right from the start that we had an opportunity. In the midst of all that rubble, we had an opportunity. Greensburg was no exception, but these Kansans are made of industrious, pioneer farming stock. There was work to do, and only 88 days until the new school year would begin. For the citizens of Greensburg, it wouldn't be enough just to bring in temporary facilities. A solid, practical, and proactive plan for the school's long-term future must also be put firmly in place. Good seed would have to be planted during that 88-day window in order to see a quality harvest for Greensburg school system and the generations of students to come. In the uh first few days after the storm, we developed uh, immediately the, the call that we had to do everything that we could for students, for the community, and for the parents, but always for students first. And Mr. Hedrick said that we could rebuild the school. We knew if we build it back the exact same way that it was, we were destined for the same future. It wasn't a real positive looking future. So we tried to identify what could we do to give our community a better chance of not only surviving the disaster, but hopefully thriving after the disaster. This community has always put a real value on the education of our youth and the education of citizens across the community, regardless of their ages. And with this tornado 
and with the school being destroyed and the opportunity to build a new one gave that opportunity to put the county together in one school. And I, I encouraged that. I made sure I supported it in the public uh, and encouraged the school board members and the superintendent that yes, this is the direction we needed to go. The arduous process of clearing rubble, removing or replacing damaged pipes and lines to make way for temporary school trailers progressed. At the same time, continuous meetings were held with citizens, students, government, and school officials to determine a long-term plan. One theme emerged, the notion of practical sustainability. Green, to be sure, but green built to last, a concept not unfamiliar to these Heartland Prairie residents. Listen as some of the town's leaders discuss the decision-making process. Prior to the tornado, Greensburg was not unlike any other rural community in, in America. Uh, aging population, not providing opportunities for our youth to come back to the community. So we were dwindling in population and getting older. That was a systematic problem that we've had throughout rural America. The tornado on May 4th of 2007 not only devastated the whole community, but allowed us the opportunity and blessed us with the opportunity to correct some of those systematic problems of, of uh, population, of the economy, of the commerce, of the community. And in the midst of that also, we were afforded the opportunity to rebrand ourselves of what we were going to be and where we wanted to be in the future of a, a long-term vision and goal. And so we looked at what advantages we could incorporate, that we could, we could give our community members, give our citizens, give the people that, that live within our, 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 our county that maybe you don't find in other places. We wanted to make sure if you're driving down Highway 54 and you drive up by small town after small town after small town, that there's a reason to stop here, that there's something else offered here that you maybe wouldn't find other places. And that's what kind of led to the uh, all the decisions in town with regard to building a green community, uh, build a community that's built for today's needs and future needs, not based on what, what we needed 50 years ago or 100 years ago. And when we first got involved in the project, this the city or the school district was looking at three or four different sites. and the majority of the sites were outside of town and we were very concerned that if they if they selected a site that was out of town that it was going to really hurt the longevity of the city and you know they really needed a, a site that was part of the city and part of the community and so when they ultimately selected this site there were two schemes one was a campus scheme that was really setting the the building kind of out in the center of campus and then we approached them and said, you know, we really think it needs to be on Main Street, that it's important for the fabric of the town that the school is right on Main Street, that it really acts as a, the southern terminus of Main Street and provides density along Main Street. And one of the things Darren told us early on in the project was the sense of community and how kids could take a lunch break and walk down to the, to the mulch, mulch shop, if you will, in town. And that was one of the things that they really wanted to continue to allow, that the students were actively engaged in the community. So even though it might only be you know, two or three football field links by moving this, the, the school to the center of the campus, we felt like it was a better move to put it here on, on this. And, it, and in a way, it was a leap of faith by them because we were building on their own old football field. And it was about the only thing that survived the tornado. So, you know, for them making that leap of faith and, and, and putting it right here on the Main Street was really important. In the case of Greensburg, they, they were really looking at helping them define the future and helping them look to the future and what was going to give them, their students, the best chance to succeed. So from my perspective, if I were a superintendent, I'd be asking what makes you unique about being able to design a school that's going to really help our students be successful. And that's first and foremost, whether it's energy, whether it's building shape, those things seem to be the most important is what, what can we do in our school environment to give each and, one, each and every one of our students the best chance to succeed. The advantage of building a sustainable school facility wasn't immediately apparent to all those in town. But there were a lot of points in favor of it. It's the, it's the financially wise thing to do. When you look at building facilities, um, you can't just look at the cost of construction. You need to look at life cycle costs. And even though you may have to pay a little more upfront for some green elements, when you look at the, the savings you have in um, energy bills and maintenance bills and things like that, overall, it's just a, it's a smart thing to do. 
um, if I ever have to build a house again, I will look for um, some of those elements just because it's fiscally or financially responsible. One of the premises of um, kind of sustainability is the idea of less is more. And, it, you know, you don't want to put in secondary systems to just cover something up. And so here, for instance, you'll notice the perforated metal deck up here. Well, it's acoustically treated behind there so that we're actually letting the, the, the system that's supporting the roof also do the work of the acoustical tile that you would have had. And you're not buying another material and putting another layer in to hide something. And you're getting additional volume. And so, so there's this notion of efficiency that, that I think is really pretty powerful here. Sustainability is like a three-legged stool. It's about business, it's about environmental stewardship, and it's about people. So when you're looking at buildings and you're looking at your budget, you have to think, am I being good steward of the resources that we've been blessed with? Are we gonna be able to maintain business and commerce? And is it good for people? And when we take those three things and put them together, then we have true sustainability. And I think you're also then expressing to the people that, that live here, the students and the faculty, that they're really seeing how the building works. And I think in a school, it's a really kind of a basic tenet that you ought to let people see how these spaces function, how they're put together, how they understand how they operate, the fact that they can see the, see, you know, see the, 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 the water distribution lines and the sprinkler systems and the primary structure here. Uh, I think just helps educate them. I mean, it's a very basic premise for, for, for being a school. and I, It wasn't hard to sell them at all, in fact. I mean, they, were, they really bought into the idea that they wanted to do something that was very uh, open and uh, more transparent, I suppose. Sustainability is simply, for me, the ability to endure, the ability to continue in existence as a society. And that's what we wanted to make sure that we did here is to provide those opportunities for future generations. It's not about political liberalism or conservatism or wherever you think, whatever you think that has to do with the green movement. It's really not about that. It's just about being wise with the money that you have to spend on facilities. Plans are one thing, but funds are another. Typically, FEMA will assist in replacing destroyed buildings but the support does not cover innovations and improvements. You're not going to get support for the new technologies, whether you're looking at geothermal wells or you're looking at, at uh, wireless internet throughout or you're looking at uh, some kind of uh, video display, whatever it may be, you're going to get what it was that you lost. And so the challenge is filling those gaps in between what you have some assistance to, to, uh, to replace and the 100% your nickel, which is all the new stuff. And so uh, we had a lot of things that would be classified, I would say, as not FEMA eligible. And in this facility, um, those items we had identified as not FEMA eligible was about $12.5 million. Those must come from the community or other sources. The planners in Greensburg once again persevered. One of the ideas, and people often question when you do something that's sustainable or green or, or um, like a lot of the lead buildings we have in town, is, is doesn't cost you more up front. And I would say yes, in many cases it does cost you more money up front. But I also know that when we started looking at everything we did in the building, we didn't consider just construction costs, upfront costs. We also considered lifetime lifetime costs. You know, because you're going to be in a building not the first year you build it. You're going to be in it for the next 20, 40, 70, 80, however many years you're in that building. And anything you can do to reduce uh, cost over the lifetime or life cycle of that building, I think, is a huge advantage. And then we can illustrate you know, those savings in, in multiple ways around the school. So, so when we start a design process, the first thing we look at is the site. And site orientation is really critical in a project like this. We really wanted to understand where the prevailing winds were, the sun angles. And we had heard Darren talk about the fact that he really wanted classrooms that were filled with light. And so the first thing in our mind that came up was we really needed to put the, the, the primary classrooms on an east-west axis. And that really is a, for two reasons. One, you can control the amount of solar gain that comes into the classroom, but two, you can also control fairly easily the amount of light that gets into the classroom and it's fairly predictable. While there may be a higher sun angle in the summer and a lower sun angle in the winter, you can control it and predict it rather than on an east-west orientation where it's this direct low angle that you simply can't control. So that was really our first strategy, was creating these two long bars. So there was a, a, a bar here and a bar behind it with the central courtyard that was really 
the, the core of the building. The other thing that I think you'll notice is very unique about the school is the corridors are all single loaded so that all the classrooms have great southern light and great exposure. And the classrooms aren't a traditional shape. They're not the normal kind of a shoebox or a rectangle with a flat roof in it. But instead, we've allowed both natural southern light to come into the classroom, but also be mixed with a cooler northern light. And then we also have a sloped ceiling in there with operable windows on the north side so that we can get flow through ventilation, which was another strategy. We always try and start with things that are passive in nature, that we don't have motors running, we don't have to um, spend money, if you will, to be um, sustainably minded. I didn't hear a lot of concern about building a, a green, sustainable facility. I heard concern about how we got funded. And the fact that Mr. Hedrick was able to lead us through that funding process and get it done without addition, there are people still you know, out there somewhere that say, you know, when, when are we going to see the cost? It, it, it's not there. There are a lot of requirements that must be met to achieve the prestigious LEED Platinum rating, but Greensburg met them all and achieved net zero energy as well. In fact, the school district is net zero, and it's net zero because of the alternative, uh, the wind farm. So, you know, it's, it's all of its power is coming from the wind farm. So it's a net zero energy building. Now, it's not net zero on site, but if you think of it as a campus and if you think of the city as a campus, it's effectively net zero. LEED has several, or there are several levels of LEED certification. Platinum is the highest. And uh, this city really made a commitment to rebuilding green and any city building. The city council voted for those buildings to be re rebuilt to platinum status. So there are a lot of platinum facilities in our town and our school is just one of those. Um, that's a that's kind of a proud thing for us. I, I think it's it's a huge accomplishment to have gone through all of the the uh, all, just all of the hoops you have to jump through to get something like that accomplished. When you build a lead facility, that lead uh, all the things that you do to, to get that kind of accreditation, uh, start certification in your building involves lots of steps, and especially steps early on in the construction. So when we look at the construction of this building, we not only manage what what efficiency you have within the building with regard to, to control of temperatures and humidities and CO2 levels and acoustic levels and lighting levels and all the things that go into that, but also from a construction perspective, how much waste you have, what kind of waste product you have, how much you're producing. But we weighed everything we hauled away from here. And we're looking at about 130 square foot, 130 thousand square foot facility and I think we hauled away three dumpsters worth of debris and trash. So I mean we really do a very good job of, of recycling product and our, our construction man from the downboard construction did an awesome job with regard to that. You know they put their dumpsters out and the trash dumpster is the last one you get to. So you got to walk by every recycled container before you get to that one. <laughs> and it's amazing you want the shortest trip. So if you've got something that can jump off into the wood recycle or the, or the block recycle, you get it thrown away as quickly as possible. So really pleased with how that came about. This is our recycling bin that we got in the hallways. Um, before the tornado, I probably would have never used it because we didn't have this as an option in our old school. But now that I'm more aware of the Green Initiative and our school, just it's everywhere around us. Like, here it is, it's like not being forced upon us. And with the wood that you see everywhere in the school, it's all recycled and reclaimed wood from barns from around the area. And it really brings down the acoustics and makes everything more quiet, because in a building that's all concrete, you kind of need that. Here we are in front of our library. This is one of our shared spaces. We have shared spaces throughout the school, such as the library, cafeteria, band room, and gymnasiums. And shared spaces are important to our building because it just helps like, with saving money. Here in the weight room, it's, pretty, it's a pretty cool experience just to have these windows open all day long and just natural light coming in and not really have to have the lights at all during the day. And one of the coolest things here is being here at 6 in the morning and you can see the sun just coming up over the horizon while you're lifting. It's a really cool site. Right out those doors is our courtyard area. At the far end is one of our six cisterns. Here at the school we can hold up to about 121,000 gallons of recycled rainwater, which we use to water our grass. These behind me, this is our water cistern. What they do 
is there's pipes all around on the roof and they funnel the water into these cisterns and then the cisterns use them to like water our grass and stuff and that helps save water. I mean, other people don't have to use that water and then also the school doesn't have to pay for the water. Each of the classrooms has its own dedicated supply air system that's coming off the heat pump system so that from an acoustical perspective we're able to isolate each and every classroom which is one of the requirements of LEAD for schools to really have very high acoustical separation. Coming into these new classrooms it's um, a lot brighter with natural lighting as where you're in the fluorescent lighting of a, what most schools are. These schools they have so much natural lighting that you just feel way more awake when you're learning and you feel almost like you're outside and I just feel a lot more open and that's one thing that I love about our school. Once the decision was made and the building was completed, the myriad advantages of their new school building were readily apparent. Really, facilities make a difference. Um, they really make a difference and I think here we had great staff before the tornado, we had good sta great staff during the temp in the temporary facilities, but now this facility draws quality staff to seek employment here. This facility is that kind of facility. We can get good staff here, which is always in the best interest of our students. I had interviewed and had agreed to come to Greensburg roughly about a week before the tornado. From the get-go, you know, uh, Mr. Hedrick and Mr. Fulton both said, if, you know, if I wanted to come, that would be great, but if I wanted out of my contract, I could. But just from those two, I mean, they were already so positive, and we will have a school, and, you know, I just never had any doubt that I still had a job. They cared enough to include me in on that, so it was never a question of not coming here. Uh, behind me, you see a wind generator, and the wind generator does cost money up front. We spend about $300,000 on 50 kilowatt tower. But we do know over the life cycle of that wind generator, we'll produce at least around $700,000 worth of utilities of power. Power is about 10% of what we had going on here at the school. The advantage of a ground source heat, heat pump system in our case was that we could actually go down to, you know, fairly deep into the earth and actually take advantage of the Ogallala aquifer that was here and the, the constant temperature that was there and capture that that temperature for both heating and cooling. So we weren't trying to take the outside air, rather we were trying to take the Earth's internal temperature, which is kind of a constant 55, 58 degree kind of a temperature range, use it as our base cooling line. So when it's zero degrees outside, we're working with something that's 55 degrees rather than zero. And, and by doing that, um, we were able to reduce our, our heating and cooling demand by a very, fairly significant factor. In fact, the school um, over the first year of its life uh, operated at about 50% less energy consumption than a normal school would have. So we know it's working. One of my favorite parts about the green aspects of the school is the natural lighting in the gym. We've got all this natural lighting up here and some windows back behind me. And the thing about that is that you could be in here during the day without the lights on and you can't even tell that they're off. Like it lets in that much light and it makes the gym feel so much brighter and more friendly instead of one of those dark dungeon gyms that some people have and it's just more welcoming to everyone and it also saves money when the lights are off. I've used it as an eco ecology lesson. We talk about why we have the wind turbine, what it's for. Uh, we talk about why the lights come on by themselves and we don't have light switches. We talk about saving water, we recycle. I use it as an ecology lesson all year. It comes up all the time. I feel like it's a lot better learning space than the trailers were. You know, you don't have distractions. Um, we have really good technology. And I think the kids take their learning more seriously in this building than they did in the trailers. Everything is uh, neat and orderly and set up in such a nice way that I think that they stand taller and they, they work harder to be, you know, to, to do their best when they have a nice environment around them. The decision to rebuild green wasn't necessarily easy to make. Navigating all the requirements and seeing the project to completion was difficult, even tedious at times. There may have been times when we questioned 
why are we doing this again? <laughs> That's a lot of hoops to jump through. I don't want to leave you the impression that it was easy. Um, because it, it wasn't, it was very difficult. It's very difficult for a lot of people to even make the decision to stay in a community in a town that was gone. It would take just over three years from that devastating night in 2007 before the building was complete. But the decisions made during those first critical 88 days would establish the foundation. I caution people everywhere in decision-making processes, don't make life decisions rapidly. Don't make them on total emotion. Make them on, on good, sound practices that will benefit future generations, not what our needs are right now. Think holistically of the view of the future. Not because it's the cool thing to do, and, but because it's the, it's the wise and smart thing to do. The choice to rebuild the school system, it, it just wasn't a choice. You had to get it done. It was the community. And to do that, it took some people, um, um, as far as the school board, as far as the administration of school, to just put in extra effort to make it happen. And when they did, it was something great. Today, everyone, from administrators to faculty, staff, and students agrees the struggle was worth it. I just want it to be like it was. Like, I want it, you know, home to make it normal. I feel like green is normal for us now. So I feel like if I was shopping for something, I'd automatically look at the low flush toilet and I'd be like, that's normal to me. Yeah. That's what right. I mean. Like, that's what I mean when I say, like, it's just ingrained into us. I mean, that's home now. Home is green. No, I would just invite anyone that possibly can to come look at this building. You know, again, just pictures, just pictures in books are one thing, videos on the internet to look and see what Greensburg schools are like, that's, that's awesome. But I think they should come, look, walk through, and, and even go in the classrooms. A lot of people do. I like to see people come in. You know, we invite them in to look. I think you really just need to come. Everybody should just come see. You've spoken with kids, you've spoken with teachers. Um, I think if you talk to those people and the people that go to school here and work in this facility, I think every hoop we had to jump through has been worth it in the end. Well, it's obvious, Mark, that so many school leaders can learn so much from Greensburg's story because a facilities challenge can occur at any place and at any time. And it was obvious in this story that the school leaders dealt with the response and recovery issues immediately that they had to deal with, but they also looked at this in a long-term situation. They knew that they had an opportunity to make systematic changes and change a culture over time. The leaders of the Greensburg community chose to take a student-centered approach. Uh, they valued input from diverse groups, the community, the students, and the architects alike. A diverse input here was so critical, and not only in looking at what decisions they had to make for their community, but also financial decisions that they had to make. They had to look and work with federal partners and local agencies, different types of funding opportunities. And so the diverse input allowed them to have such a greater depth of knowledge and such a collaborative effort that I think was a very good um, lesson to learn in this project. The uh, leaders of the community need to be good stewards. Being a good steward is making wise investments. The most valuable return in an investment in this situation is student learning. They selected design features that created flexible, well-lit, welcoming atmospheres. And they helped to create an environment where students and teachers alike can articulate the aspects of sustainable schools. You know, they didn't just think about um, those short-term funding things or short-term gains that they would make in achievement, they really thought about what funding source um, would give them the best opportunity. The Greensburg story reminds us that challenges require commitment, it requires communication, and it requires a lot of work. But the challenges, even the great challenges, can lead to changes that meet short-term needs as well as long-term goals. Kathy Hedrick, school counselor, has provided additional information regarding student mental health and well-being. Hi, I'm Kathy Hedrick, Guidance Counselor for Kiowa County Elementary and Junior High School. We believe the building does indeed foster learning, as well as physical and mental health. 
One of the most significant sustainable elements is our use of natural daylighting. Teachers see a positive difference in the student's ability to focus. Bringing the outside in through the use of windows in virtually every space affects the moods of teachers and students as compared to other facilities. Additionally, there is no sound pollution like the distracting buzz of fluorescent lighting. Another design element that seems to contribute to mental health was the decision to put all of our pre-K through 12 classrooms under one roof. Although our building is designed to keep grade levels separate during instructional time, through shared spaces in our cafeteria, our library, and our gymnasium, our students and staff stay visibly connected to one another, giving our building more of a family feel across grade levels. Our classrooms are spacious, and both students and staff comment on not feeling boxed in and confined. Finally, the design of the building allows us to control temperature, humidity, and air quality inside our building, making this a physically healthier environment. We have no data but personal experiences. This is a school where the effort to effectively create learning environments has been achieved through a collaborative effort among our Board of Education, administration, teachers, architects, and builders. I am proud to report that Kiowa County Elementary and Junior High achieved a building-wide standard of excellence in reading and math this year. The Elementary Junior High was also recognized in 2012 as a Title I Reward School, designating us in the top 10% of Title I schools in the state of Kansas. We invite everyone to do the exact same thing that Greensburg did by visiting the ASEF website to look at alternative resources and research that they may access to help them deal with the problems and challenges that they face. They can visit us online at acefacilities.org, they can call our 1-800 number at 855-610-ASEF, or they can visit us by live chat, by email. We have great things to, to share with you and we want you to use those and so we invite people to do that.